I think you can see that, right? Okay. Well, good morning, everybody. <laughs> it's wonderful to see all of you, to be back here uh, at the Long Island Society. And uh, I'm, I want to talk to you about the encampment for citizenship. So uh, we have some photographs here that go back to the founding days. So I think you, you might recognize this woman, right? Eleanor Roosevelt, right? Uh, she was involved with the New York Society for Ethical Culture and was a big supporter of the encampment when it was started in 1946 by Algernon Black and Alice, also known to most people as Nanny Pollitzer, who was a, a prominent uh, civic leader. And this offered young adults an opportunity uh, from many, many different backgrounds, many religious, racial, social, I'm gonna make sure that you can hear me, Muriel, so I'm gonna, is that better if I'm kissing the mic? Okay. <laughs> All right, I'm aware that sometimes it's difficult to hear. Anyway, uh, after World War II, Algernon Black, who was uh, a leader at the New York Society, thought about democracy a lot. And he talked about that with his dear friend, Eleanor Roosevelt. And they said, if we claim to have made the world safer for democracy, having won World War II, um, then let's really think about what that means. And what it meant was that there was still a great deal of racism and discrimination, misogyny in the United States. And one way to address it was to bring together young people to live together in their own democracy, one that they created for six weeks. And for 20 years, they did that on the Fieldston campus. That's the Ethical Culture Fieldston School. And Algernon Black brought in speakers, uh, including Dr. Martin Luther King. Uh, he brought in many speakers, but also encouraged the students themselves to form their own democracy. And he encouraged them so much um, that they were empowered. I'll give you an example of their empowerment. Um, I've been fortunate enough to be included in uh, reunions of, of the encampment because I'm an, I'm an encamper wannabe. I didn't get to go. I did go with American Field Service to Germany for a summer. But I wish I had had the opportunity that seven, over 7,000 students had to be in the encampment from the time that it was active, 1946 to about 1996. And during that time, uh, the empowerment really, uh, I'll give you a couple of examples of it. One day, a couple of the students had traveled from Fieldston down into Manhattan because they heard that Malcolm X was going to be speaking in a rally. And so they were there and they listened to him and uh, they liked what he had to say. And so afterwards, because they knew they could do this, they walked right up to him and said, uh, you know, we are so impressed with what you have to say. We'd like to take you out to lunch. May we do that? And he said, of course you may. And during lunch, they said, we've got this wonderful thing going on uptown in Fieldston. It's called the encampment. And would you like to go back there with us? He said, well, I've got kind of a full schedule today, but how about if I meet you there tomorrow? And he did. And so not only did they have Dr. Martin Luther King there, but they also had Malcolm X. And that was not something planned by the organizers. That was something the students themselves knew that they wanted to do and that they needed to do. And it was one of the many stories I heard during the, um, some of these reunions that I had. Another story is uh, after the first or the second encampment, some of the fellows got together. And bear in mind that they came from across the country and they also came from Native American reservations, which was unheard of at the time. So it was unique enough to bring together African Americans, Christians, and Jews. Um, I, to my knowledge, there were no Muslims that were included. I'm looking at Lynn and Arthur, but to my knowledge, no Muslims were included. Not that they weren't welcome, for sure, um, but there's only so much recruitment, I think, that, that the, the founders, the organizers could do. But many of them were supported through unions and also through uh, the Farm Bureau. So we had the farmers from Iowa, for example, spending time in Fieldston, and then afterwards they decided that they really would like to go to DC, that they've learned how to be better citizens, they created uh, a democracy of their own during these six weeks, and so let's go down to DC on our own and get together with our congressional representatives. And so some of the folks uh, at the camp said, that's a great idea, we'll go with you. So they arranged to have accommodations at the local Y. The only thing is when they showed up in New York City at the YMCA, only whites were allowed. Only whites were allowed. 
And so uh, the people, the group decided that they were, none of them would stay there. And they went to Harlem and they found another, other accommodations up there. So right away, these farm boys from Iowa got that sense of what it was like um, because they obviously lived in a very homogeneous environment. So to go to New York City and have that experience. Um, so they were in New York City and then they went down to DC from there, had a similar experience and found accommodations in DC. So while they were there, uh, who should be there but what the, uh, uh, from the UK, an ambassador, who was getting together with the Farm Bureau and talking about farming there. And uh, one of the boys said, young men said, um, you know, with all due respect, I understand that you're coming to, to learn things, but I don't think you're going to learn a lot here in DC. Wouldn't you like to visit my family on our farm in Iowa? And sure enough, this ambassador did and spent about a week with them. And they can really attributed this to the kind of experience they had at Fieldston that allowed them, empowered them to claim their own authority as citizens. Um, and also that kind of experience they had with one another. So the encampment is a nonprofit organization that conducts residential summer programs today with year-round follow-up of young people from widely diverse backgrounds and from nations. And when I say from nations, today we have, it was resurrected, as it were, back in 2013, and there are a number of students joining us who are undocumented. And last summer when we were at uh, Hampshire College in Amherst, one of the many social justice activities they had was to go into Boston and to observe uh, an immigration court. And so imagine, if you will, some of these students who are undocumented and very fearful now after the most recent election, but this was last summer where they were still hopeful, and uh, went into the immigration court and had a wonderful session with the judge there uh, where they were able to be honest about their own status and what they were going through themselves and to be able to learn uh, what that whole system involves, what it's all about. So. My direct experience with the encampment goes back to goes back to 2008, and I was learning more and more about the encampment and feeling very envious of everyone who had gone and everyone who had helped to organize it and were the mentors there. And so I went online and I couldn't find anything, but I found a couple of people who were also trying to get together a reunion, and one of them was Ruth Thaler Carter, uh, who happens to live very close to my hometown. She lives in Rochester, New York. So I found out uh, by calling her that she was trying to put something together and I was trying to put something together. So we reached out to as many people as we could through email, through um, phone calls, and we really weren't active much on Facebook, although we tried to do that as well. So when I was at the New York Society, I raised it to the board and said, we need to host a reunion. And of course they agreed. So in May 2009, we had the first alumni uh, reunion that they had held, I think, maybe ever. Uh, there, there were certainly some uh, you know, friendly gatherings that had met over the years, but this was a real official one. And so there weren't too many people, but there were about 50 people, which was not bad, given that we, we had to reach out by email and by phone. And we met in ceremonial hall for this first reunion. And we decided on three goals. One was to form the Alumni Association, which we did that day. The second was to find a safe place for the archives. And why did we need a safe place? Well, because they were held in Margaretha Jones's apartment. Um, some of them were held at the New York Society basement. And sadly, some of them were in a garage in California where there had been a fire. So we wanted to make sure that we didn't lose anything else, not a single piece of paper, not a single photograph. We wanted to make sure we didn't lose any of that. So one of the alumni, um, Ed Peoples, has a connection with the Commonwealth of Virginia a School there and found a space for them. So now, at the James Branch Cobble Library Special Collection and Archives at the Virginia Commonwealth University, you will find the archives of the encampment for citizenship. 
And what's so cool about that is if you go online, um, you will see photographs like the one that just disappeared. <laughs> you will find um, a lot of information that other, I, I can just do this. Yay, okay. Is this a touch screen or can I? No, okay, then I'm just, okay, then I'm just gonna do this. It's there. It's there. I know it's there. I know it's there. I want, I want to get to the next one. <laughs> okay, so here's, an, here's another one. So you can see some of the young folks at Fieldston. Um, so that was two things accomplished. You know, first, we had the Alumni Association, um, and then within a year or so, we were able to get the archives. And then in 2000, July 2013, um, at the Virginia Commonwealth University was the reinvigoration was the resurrection of the encampment and we could only afford to hold it for two weeks but it was held and that was glorious the next summer 2014 was in Chicago the University of Illinois and we raised enough money to extend it to three weeks and to add an intergenerational weekend and that brought together more and more alumni who then formed a, sort of a nucleus of a support group for the encampers. So now we knew that we had enough alumni that would be coming every summer so that we could connect them to the students. So the next summer, we ended up in Tougaloo, and I want to tell you a little bit more about that because that was a very exciting time for me as well. We went to Tougaloo College in uh, Jackson, Mississippi. And uh, when we were there, we had the wonderful opportunity to meet not only other encampers, um, but we also had the opportunity to meet one of the, um, one of the, the Freedom Riders um, who actually shared with us his stories here we go. And his name was, just look for this. He is the Mississippi, Mississippi Veterans of the Civil Rights Movement, Dr. Mr. Hollis Watkins. And that, I can't tell you what a thrill that was for the students and for the adults who were there. He told us stories um, about uh, refusing to leave his jail cell because he knew that if he left it, that he would be followed and he would be shot. Um, indeed, they had dogs right outside the door, and they would show him the way out. You know, it's, it's okay, boy. It's okay. You just go out there, and you run, and you'll be, you'll be safe. It'll be fine. And he said, no, I'm not leaving this cell. I know what's happening, and I'm going to stay right here. Um, and so when you get those kinds of stories from people, uh, whether it's from a, a civil rights uh, worker or whether it's from somebody from the women's movement, and the kids get to hear this for themselves, you can't imagine the power that that has. So with more alumni returning, the students were all encouraged to come into the program with their own projects. And then we would connect them with the alumni so they can continue with that project throughout the year. And let me give you an example. It's probably no surprise to you that um, our indigenous nations are still stuck, many of them on reservations, that are, uh, whether the education is poor, uh, the health is poor, um, it is, continues to be a great sin of, of our nation that so many people are still stuck on these reservations and are given very little support. Um, and as I said, since 1946, we've had Native Americans involved in the encampment. One young lady came with a very special project. Four of her friends had committed suicide. That's not uncommon on Indian reservations. And so she came with a hope that she would connect with other people and with adults who could help her put together a suicide hotline. And so she developed that project throughout the, uh, throughout the four weeks. We were able to extend it to four weeks in 2015. And then at the, at the last weekend, during the intergenerational weekend, she was able to connect with adults and with mentors who could really help her put that on the ground, really get some traction for that. So after that summer, we recognized, and I was lucky enough to be on the board at that point, um, after that time, we realized that we needed to stay in touch with the encampers throughout the year. Um, in order to check in with them, to make sure that they were doing well on their projects. Um, if they needed support, they would have it. Um, and that one of the alumni could be there on the spot, um, uh, by phone, by email, even in person. 
And so we started to do a couple of five-day retreats during the winter and during the spring. And we're hoping to raise money, more money, to be able to continue with that. So um, I am going to put in a pitch uh, to go onto the website and to make donations, because in the early days, uh, in the 40s, the 50s, and even into the 60s, there were many unions who were supporting it. Also, as I mentioned before, the Farm Bureau was supporting it. The Carpenters Union would send people. I mean, it was a very big deal for, um, for local uh, union chapters to send, send students. Uh, now we don't have those deep pockets. We don't have those connections. We're trying hard to get grants, uh, one from the Kellogg Foundation, uh, but it's been difficult. But you know what? I think in some ways it's a good thing. The silver lining to not having all the grants that were available in those early years is that the alumni have made such a commitment to raise the funds themselves, to do the recruitment themselves. And the Alumni Association has determined that they will not let this fail again. It failed in the, in the mid-1990s due to a lack of funds because all of those grants had dried up. And they didn't have a more diverse base. And isn't that the case of, of, of so many worthy institutions? I'll give you an example from our history. Jane Addams was an ethnoculture lecturer, and she started the Hull, Hull House, one of many settlement houses in the country. T uh, John Lovejoy Elliott started another one, Hudson Guild, in Chelsea. What's the difference between the two of them? Well, in 2014, when we went to Chicago for the encampment, we went to visit what was left of Hull House, and it's just a museum, because they didn't really look to broaden and diversify, deepen in, in their, their portfolio of, uh, of grants and, and to find out other places where they could receive that funding. They relied too much on government funds. Hudson Gill was forced, had a, with a lot of foresight, realized that they weren't going to be able to depend upon government funds forever, not least because as the Chelsea neighborhood became wealthier, that meant that city funds became less frequent. In other words, if you're looking at your zip code and you're seeing what the income is, even though you have projects and you have Hudson Guild, you also have the High Line, which is bringing in really, I mean, million, multi-million dollar condos. So the city funding cut down. So they diversified a lot of their funding. And I hope you check out Hudson Guild, um, because it's still part of our history, part of our legacy, and still very, very active in the Chelsea neighborhood. So the alumni decided they were not going to rely on that. Of course, they were going to be looking for grants, but they were going to be holding fundraisers wherever they lived. And in November, we had a simply glorious anniversary. Uh, in November, it was the birthday of Algernon Black, the founder of the encampment, and we brought together Peter uh, Neufeld, um, who spoke, of course, Peter is the co-founder of the, uh, the Innocence Project, and I want to make sure that all of you see this and make sure that you get this commemorative copy of Time Magazine, which is about the Innocence Project on their 25th anniversary. So that's just one of many uh, alumni that uh, the encampment can support. Um, one another one is Eleanor Holmes Norton, uh, Miles Rappaport, who started Common Cause and Demos. Um, the Fortune Society was also started by an encampment person. And uh, in, Mayo, in Manhattan, Gail Brewer, our borough president, is also uh, an alumna and a tremendous, tremendous supporter of the, um, of the encampment. I'm just going to show you another photograph here. I mentioned uh, Eleanor Roosevelt before, and uh, her support was incalculable, invaluable. Um, what she did, and, and she did it at a considerable risk to herself. Um, because at one point during the encampment, um, we came under attack uh, because this is the McCarthy era in the 50s. And so Eleanor Roosevelt, who was a longtime chair of the encampment, and she often hosted the students for discussions and workshops and barbecues at her Hyde Park estate. When the encampment program was attacked by the McCarthy Act forces in the early 1950s, she vigorously defended it. And you might ask, why was it attacked? Well, 
It was a group of young people who were African American, white, Jewish, Christian. Um, let's see, uh, they came uh, Africa, they were also indigenous peoples, and guess what? They all lived together. They lived together. And after 20 years at Fieldston, they traveled around the country, and there were some places like Tennessee or Kentucky where that was frowned upon. Uh, you did not all live together. So the McCarthyites went after them, and Eleanor Roosevelt said, the reason I think these encampments are so important is that they are, is that they are attended by citizens of different races and groups they prepare people for thinking in terms of all people and not in terms of a selected few. Not only we in the United States, but people all over the world need young people trained to be good citizens with an ability to think with an open mind. Mm. And I was certainly thinking about that when I went to Tougaloo College um, in, in Mississippi. Uh, by the way, July is not the best time to go to Mississippi. <laughs> It is so hot and so humid. And what I became aware of there, and I had never known this, is that Tougaloo College itself not only is a part of the Mississippi Freedom Trail, uh, but they actually, the faculty, the students, the staff, fueled the Jackson Civil Rights Movement. And they were able to do this because it was a private college. It was not a state college or university. In a state college and university, they would, all of their funds would have been taken away from them. That was not the case here. And so that campus became a hotbed of civil rights uh, activity and more than once was attacked. So you can imagine that the students were literally on the ramparts of the campus keeping watch to make sure that no one infiltrated because they were harboring leaders of the civil rights movement on that campus. So to have, now we have high school students, so imagine 16, 17, 18 year olds now are hearing these stories, are hearing these stories and taking them in, um, and knowing that they uh, are our hope for the future. Speaking of hope, one of the things that I really want to emphasize about the encampment today is that since the 1980s, there has been a concerted effort in public education not to offer civics classes. This has been intentional. Um, those of us who were raised in the 50s and the 60s know well that the pedagogy of John Dewey saw us through that time. Um, we learned to be critical thinkers. We learned to have festivals and fairs and community service and bringing speakers in. Um, we engaged in debate. We did all those things that John Dewey encouraged, and it was the 100th anniversary last year of his tome, Democracy in Education. How well he knew that without that kind of education, democracy won't survive. It just won't survive. And we're experiencing that today. The reason that we have the kind of administration that we have the reason that we are posting hashtag resist and going to the Women's March and the March for Science and climate change is because since the 1980s, we have not been teaching our students civics. They have not been taught how to be citizens. And it's not simply about how one votes. It's about how one engages every single day as a citizen. That's what the encampment taught. And that's why so many of the alumni hold political office, are involved in starting organizations, are committed to making the world a better place for everyone. And now those alumni are committed to encouraging and empowering a new generation who come in with very solid projects that they want to then take home with them and continue. We need only look to, uh, to, to Muriel, to her children, uh, who not only are cradle ethical cultures here at Long Island, but also with the encampment, Peter with the Innocence Project and Russell with Legal Aid for many years, um, and so many of the, the, the alumni who have continued that and hark back to that experience as being life-changing, life-changing for them. 
and also for those who mentored them. And sometimes very tragic. Peter was in a group of encampers who had had a meeting with some coal miners from Kentucky. And they listened to them, they heard their stories, they really bonded with them. And not long after that meeting, the coal mine collapsed. And many of the people with whom they had bonded, with whom they had formed a friendship, from whom they had learned deep lessons, they died. And so they had that kind of real experience of what happens to real people, you know, not in ivory towers, but real people in real situations. The encampment was also in Berkeley during a lot of the uh, student demonstrations there. But you know, in the 80s, uh, the policymakers said, that's not really good for business. You know, civil rights movement, peace movement, not really good for business. So you know what? We're going to take away a lot of social studies and civics classes. We're not going to fund them anymore. And we're going to really emphasize what you can test for. So you can test for math, you can t test for reading. Kind of hard to test for civics. So they learned a kind of rote, you know, there are three branches of government, blah, blah, blah. But they didn't actually engage. They didn't actually engage in debates, unless, of course, you went to a private school or you went to a public school where the parents were very involved. The latest statistic on the uh, proficiency of high school students in public schools, proficiency in civics is only 25%. It's higher if it's a private school or if, if it's a very well-funded public school, say like maybe Great Neck, but probably not so much in Roosevelt. So one of the things that I have been really emphasizing at the New York Society um, and at the encampment is that for us ethnoculturists, non-theistic religion of ethics, democracy is sacred. It is. Because it calls upon us in what, ethical, in what Felix Adler called an ethical manifold, which means many parts, not one, many parts, that is organic and that only works because everyone is involved in all of our differences and all of our uniquenesses because we need each other. Adler went so far as to say even the universe needs all of our exertions but certainly our democracy does. And certainly these young people in the encampment need our support. And so I would like to show you a video um, and I hope this works with the sound. Okay, great. So Chris is gonna help me with this. This is a short, it's only four minutes. Um, and this was uh, recorded in 2016. And we had the encampment at Hampshire College in Amherst where we are going to return this July. And we've been able to extend it to four weeks, and our goal is to get it back to the original six weeks. So, here we go. Should we turn off the light? No, that looks fine. Like if some of the encampment in one word, it would be inspired. If I can sum up the encampment in one word, it would have to be liberating. The encampment makes me feel empowered. If I could sum up encampment in one word, it would be amazing and adventurous. But that's two words. <laughs> the Encampment for Citizenship is a life-changing leadership program for young people aged 15 to 18. The Encampment empowers young people to tackle social justice challenges head-on and make a positive difference in their communities and the world. Young people from varied backgrounds live and learn together for three weeks and leave having made lifelong connections. And campers are encouraged to think critically and are exposed to real life situations that open their eyes <coughs> and change their outlook, not only of the world, but of themselves. I feel like it gives people that don't really have a voice in the community a voice and makes them want to change, change their community, change, change the way they think, and it's a, also a good experience too. A change I noticed in me was that I'm more willing to help others 
and I'm not afraid to use my voice, I'm not afraid to speak up, I'm not afraid to add a comment when it's necessary to stand up for somebody else that is kind of being belittled. Um, I'm more open-minded to different cultures and different backgrounds. Um, I'm more knowledgeable about the history, and that kind of makes me have a really strong desire to help others. In myself, I have noticed that I have changed by being more receptive to people's different perspectives and being able to listen more rather than just respond quickly. The encampment has taught me that my voice matters and that my feelings are valid. And as young as I am, I can still make a change in this world that I'm living in. A lot of the time, as young people, you know, we always see ourselves so much negative. But when we're in the campus, we create a beautiful thing within ourselves. Campus has changed me in the sense that I've gotten a different experience because being here, I've had to come over like different struggles and like that I haven't ever thought of. I think that campus is important today because a lot of people should know that they are not alone and the encampment makes you feel that way. It supports you to get to your goal, to change your community. Encampus gets to meet with local and nationally known community leaders and activists. And field trips provide opportunities to explore how larger issues are being addressed on a local level. The encampment uses the arts to give young people the opportunity to interpret the world around them in creative ways and develop both individual and collective voices to speak out for justice. Each year, the summer program concludes with an intergenerational sharing, where alums join the most recent encampers to learn from their experiences and to share their own. Join thousands of young people who have been transformed by this unique program and experience the encampment for yourself. So the New York Society sponsored Fabio, um, and he's going again this summer for a second summer. Um, and sometimes students do go for more than one summer. Marquise, uh, who's from Long Island, will be interning this summer. Um, and so we're really developing the leadership within within the um, the movement. So um, I'm fortunate enough to have a sabbatical this summer, and I'm spending a week with the encampment at Hampshire College and working on the intergenerational weekend so that uh, I can welcome the alumni there. So I'm hoping it, that if you um, are alumni or formerly were part of the encampment, that you will come during that time um, and that you will encourage others to do so and that you will continue to recruit. Uh, we have extended the application deadline in the hopes of getting more students. Um, I'll, I'll be frank with you, we need more white kids. <laughs> Um, we do. I'll just, I'll be frank with you. Um, so I'm hoping that some of the white kids uh, here in Garden City around here will be interested um, in joining the encampment. And I can tell you they will have the time of their lives and a time of, that will always, always remember. <laughs>